life. Ooh, hello. Wow, we're early. <laughs> <laughs> hello, everyone. Welcome to this panel. Um, glad you could make it. I'm going to hand over that way to Anne. Um, she will be moderating this channel. Ooh, Hi, wow, we're early. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome. Oh. <laughs> Technical difficulties. You know how it goes. Go in pains. <laughs> so, everyone, welcome. Um, we have this panel going on for costuming for the stage and screen. And so, here are five of us, and we are lucky to be part of this really great online costuming community with you. And we have varied ex professional experience through uh, costumes for film and theater, and we wanted to come together and kind of collectively page back the curtain, had to do, um, and give you all a peek um, at how we've experienced the industry and costuming for entertainment. Um, so we're gonna go over a bunch of things, uh, and we will wind up doing some questions near the end. If you do um, things in the chat, I'll be reading them when we get close to the end. Um, but we're gonna go over some like the various positions and structures um, in the commonly found in costume departments, uh, some of the differences that we have found of uh, being part of different types of theater and entertainment and film, some of the translatable skills and lessons that we've learned, how to use them, what we could possibly pass on to you, and how we got into the industry and what our training is. And uh, when you get to the end, we're gonna have a badge for you guys that you can collect. And uh, yeah, we'll just see how it all goes. So uh, without further ado, let's uh, introduce all of us. So first, our wonderful host to this, we have Nikki. Hi, uh, well, I'm Nikki. Uh, I'm from Liam or Nikki Liam on Instagram. And I have um, about 10 year plus experience in both film and theater industry. I've done uh, musicals and ballet productions um, as a dresser, as a, a costume maker, um, and as a production assistant, um, doing all of the shopping for um, materials and stuff. Um, so yeah. Bernadette next. Hi, I'm Bernadette Banner from the channel Bernadette Banner. Um, once upon a time, I worked as a design assistant. So I worked on design teams for Broadway. I didn't actually make the clothes. I just worked for the costume designer to make the designs into real actual clothes that could happen on stage. Constance. Hello, I'm Constance. I am a freelance costume maker. I mostly work in film and TV at the moment when, I'm, when we're working, but I come from a theater and an opera background. And I've always been a maker for, of costumes for, for all of those mediums. And that's what I've always wanted to do wise. So I've been pretty consistent in that. I've gone, in some other directions in order to sort of, you know, be working. But yeah, mostly I'm uh, taught from the making point. Wonderful. And Cynthia? Hi, I'm Cynthia Secchi. I own Red Threaded, which is a historical corsetry and theatrical costume business. And I got started in theatrical costuming. That's what my training is in. I've worked in regional theaters around the United States. I've also worked at the Santa Fe Opera. So I have a little bit of opera experience. Um, I've worked as a stitcher, draper, firsthand, everything in between. Um, and so I, I come from the making side of things as well, like Constance. Wonderful. And for me, um, I'm Anne from Silk and Stitches. And uh, I've worked uh, over 10 years or so in usually the technical side of theater. I've done a lot of wardrobe for musical theater, as well as um, a stitcher, uh, some draping and uh, firsthand for all sorts of regional uh, theater in the Chicagoland area, mostly musical theater. Um, so that's where that is. But with all of those words that we just threw out at you, let's uh, talk a little bit about the structures and what give a little bit of context to those words and titles that we just used. Uh, so first of all, one thing that I wanted to address because we all kind of collectively feel this um, is the role of the costume designer. And inevitably a lot of times that we tend to get that assumption that we are a costume designer, even though there are lots of other roles in the costume department. So what are your guys' experience with costume designers, what people assume and all that? Well, well, I've seen people say, yeah, no, go ahead, Bernadette. 
Oh, well, okay. So I was going to say that. So I went to school for theatrical costume design. Well, the title's different, but anyway, I feel like there's kind of an assumption within a lot of the university degree programs for costuming, theatrical film costume design, that you go to school to be a costume designer. And they do that whole thing that they do in like prestigious job training programs where they say, look around the room, one of you is going to be successful in this business and the rest of you will never work. And they try and scare you in that way. But what they don't tell you is that the role of costume designer is like this much of a percentage of like the entirety of the field of costume design for stage and screen. And even then those are two separate fields. So like within that field, okay, so maybe someone doesn't end up being a costume designer, but maybe they find that they fit better in the role of costume maker or pattern drafter or first hand or stitcher or milliner or costume assistant or costume associate or shoemaker or there, we're gonna go over all the possible positions within the costuming field, but there's not just the costume designer. And I think that's what we're gonna try and expose today. Yes. I sometimes when I'm talking to people who don't have any sort of, <clears throat> excuse me, exposure to the, the structure of costuming, I'll explain it like the costume designer is the architect of a building. They're not building the building. There's a whole level, you know, there's tiers of people below that. You have subcontractors, contractors, engineers, you know, carpenters that can kind of help people understand because a lot of our process happens behind the scenes and you, you don't really see it happening. This is very true. So um, yes, like we said, and a lot of times for all of us, we were even talking on our separate call about uh, how the vocabulary of the different positions have changed depending on the region, depending on the, um, depending on what genre of theater or film or anything there is there. So um, uh, does anyone want to talk about uh, like the different structures that they're more used to and um, like different positions there? Well, I can start off from the design aspect of things because I know like there's the design world and then there's like the world of making, which you all can probably speak better on. But so in the world that I would work in and I, to be fair, work in New York, which is, uh, first of all, American theater, but also heavily heavily unionized American theater. Like in New York, on Broadway especially, which is where I work, it's commercial entertainment. So there's obviously a lot of off-Broadway, non-union um, things happening in New York. But for the most part, where I worked on Broadway was commercial. Everything's unionized and everything's very highly structured and hierarchical and named. So you have the costume designer, who's the person who draws out, debatably, draws out the show and comes up with the vision of what the actors are going to be wearing on screen or stage. Um, under the costume designer is the associate costume designer who is sort of the like right-hand man. This is the person who's in fittings, who's sort of collaborating with the designer to maybe bounce ideas off of the designer. They're sort of the like executive function of the costume design team. They handle the budget a lot of the times, they handle a lot of the like business end of managing the team. So then under the costume, the associate costume designer are the assistant costume designers. And there's a difference, union wise, there's a different, they're the same thing, costume assistant and assistant costume designer. It's the same role, but assistant costume designer has to be union. And if you're not union, you have to be called costume assistant. So you'll see me, cause I was never union, you'll see me build in playbills as costume assistant next to assistant costume designers. It makes no sense, but that's just, you know, like the regulation of unions, I guess. But um, so the assistants are the people who sort of report to the associate costume designer. We're all, I mean, it's a small team, everyone works together, but it's just in terms of streamlining uh, work to make it more efficient. The assistants are, the associates in every day into the office every day, so are the assistants and the designer may or may not be in every day. Um, so we're the ones who run around, we do the swatching, we source materials, and we are responsible for getting those materials to the shops um, and just sort of being general coordination. And then under that, we may have some costume interns. So that's kind of, well, they're, they're also costume shoppers. So if it's a modern dress show, a lot of the shows that I've worked on personally have been um, custom built shows. So like all of the costumes in the show are built, but some shows, if they're modern dress, there's no reason to do that. 
So there's also the role of costume shopper, which is a role that's just, you know, someone whose job it is to go out and shop clothes and then do all the returns after the fittings when they said, no, not that, no, not that, we'll keep this. So that's the design world of things, roughly. <laughs> Uh, for me, it's been sort of a mishmash, humble jumble. Uh, because I'm in the Netherlands, we have the Dutch terms. Um, but when I moved to the ballet um, company, we have such an internal, international, um, co such sorry, <laughs> colleagues that uh, we sort of speak Dunglish, which is an, a mashup of Dutch and English and the terms. So. For us, the, that whole union thing, like, oh, if you're union or non-union, you're supposed to be called that. That's sort of a whole mumble jumble here. And um, you can call yourself whatever you want. <laughs> Are there unions where you, where you work? Sorry? Like, are, are there unions? Like, how uh, strong is the union culture in Europe? Not, at least... As far as I know, I've never been really involved in unions since I've always been sort of a freelancer based um, worker. There are unions, I think, but they're not as heavily regulated or heavy on rules as they are on the West End or on Broadway, as far right. as I know. Well, because on Broadway, like if you're working on, technically, if you're working on Broadway, you have to be union. There is a little bit of like trial period where you can work for a couple of years non-union, which is what I was doing. But ultimately, like technically, you're supposed to be union if you're working on Broadway. So that's yeah. really interesting. I think at one point, like there were like whispers going on in the hallways at um, Holland's biggest musical company that um, if you try to start a union, you sort of got blackmailed by the company. So it was like not really um, encouraged to do so. <laughs> Whoa. Can confirm though. <laughs> uh, well, speaking for myself and the experience that I have, um, for me, we tend to call it the costume shop. That's just like a strange thing that Americans do, maybe. It's not Very American right. thing. <laughs> yeah. I know that- Constance, what do you, Constance, what do you call them? There, the workrooms. Oh, you would call it studios. Work. It's a workroom, yes. It's a theatre workroom, the wardrobe. It, if it was a small theatre, you might just call it the wardrobe department entirely, but everywhere, apart from my first job, it tends to be, yeah, the workroom. And then that's the same in film. And then, so large theatres are split into ladies' workroom and tailoring. And everywhere is slightly different as to the rules of what they what they cover. So Glyndebourne Opera House had ladies' costume and tailoring. And I just always thought that because I used to answer the phone, ladies' costume. And... Um, and there were rules that were, if you were a woman in a trouser role in opera, you would obviously be dressed by the tailoring department if you were dressed as a man, which, you know, because there's the trouser roles in opera, which is mezzo-soprano singing as male characters. But sometimes there would be a funny crossover when they go, oh, but now that, because of the character in the story, they have to dress up as a woman, so the ladies' costume department has to then make the dress that they wear. But they wouldn't always stick to it. And then that's something that I think that was very set to where they were. And then when I've moved into film, it's still the workroom. Uh, you generally tend to be, um, well, actually, it depends on the size of the film. So if it's like the TV series that I work on a lot and some of the films I've worked on, there is just one workroom and everyone works in there. You might have a tailor or a tailor cutter in there and then a ladies cutter. Or it might be if it's really large, you're going to have a principal workroom where all the main characters are covered and then a crowd workroom that's running separately if you've got a lot of makes for the for the for the background and the extras or or say or it might just be like um it might just be one one cutter and a, and a team and we make everything it sort of depends on depends on the scale really but yes i got very confused the first time i came to america and everyone was saying oh do you work in a costume shop like, no <laughs> not realizing that that's the same <laughs> workroom <laughs> I mean, it doesn't make sense that it's called a costume shop, really. Like, the more that I heard someone say workroom and studio, I'm like, oh, that makes a lot more sense. I don't know why. We've gotten accustomed to costume shop. Uh, this is a really strange aside, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, so my theater that I tend to work for, um, the costume shop is on the street, like, um, level. So we have windows and doors to, like, the general public. And so, but it's all locked, but it says costume shop on the door of it. So people tend to especially near Halloween, start knocking on our door and ask if they can purchase something. <laughs> uh, 
Really? But anyway, that was a whole aside. Um, so <laughs> for American costume shops, or at least the ones that I've been used to, it tends to be like the in the in the workroom in the uh, costume shop, the costume shop manager, uh, his assistant, their assistants, uh, if there are multiple of them, and then as far as the building team, it tends to be a draper, multiple drapers, and first hands under them who do a lot of sometimes the cutting or the alterations or. Um, like passing off as in between stages from the draper to the stitchers and just how many stitchers underneath there. Um, and then all the other positions, because there are so many. <laughs> Can I ask a question? Because I we don't use draper in the UK. So what's the difference between draper? So draper, is that like a cutter? Or is it something else? In, is that on the stand only? Yeah, it's essentially pa the pattern maker. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes yeah, we, I've, I've heard cutter draper in the Same. US, but that seems to be a term that is falling off. Like I haven't heard it as much in the last 10 years, I would say, as when I was first starting. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, and that might just be a regional thing too, or like where I've worked. Um, but yeah, cutter, draper, pattern maker, yes. Yeah, and stick maker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then you have the whole crafts department if you're in a costume, if you're if you're in a theater or you know whatever with enough money to have an entire crafts department, you might have a crafts head and a milliner and a dyer and Shoemaker. all of that. Mm -hmm. So if you yeah. find yourself drawn to costumes, but you're you don't really want to sew all day, but you want to make stuff, there are other options. You can go into the kind of niche realms of of crafts. And um, like prop costumes as well. Is is that is that like another side yeah. like? Like getting more three-dimensional or it has to involve certain techniques as well. I noticed that there are some workrooms, there's one workroom in particular in the UK that's really known for its craft and, and not craft, three-dimensional prop costumes and they make all sorts of stuff but they still need people that, that are completely trained in the sewing and costume background even if they're then really going for it with the, with the strange materials and the glue. They still need both people, I find anyway. Cool. Well, so those are, that's like a general overview of some of the positions that are in either design and uh, the build team for costume departments. So let's talk about um, the different branches and different styles. So uh, those of us who have um, been part of film and television, how is that different than doing things for theater? Uh, work hours, <laughs> I think the biggest difference uh, working in film, uh, you can have night shoots, you can have day shoots, morning shoots. Uh, basically, it can be anywhere within the 24 hour realm and um, you can be on any kind of location. You can be in the studio. Um, you have to be really flexible regarding that. Um, unlike when you work in a theater, you have set times, you have a schedule and you can actually plan your social life. <laughs> That's a really good point. And also depending on the scale of the production. So when a film or a TV series is setting up, they will have different, like you have the running wardrobe in theatres and maybe a, maybe a making room in a theatre, a workshop or a workroom. The, the, the TV and film is split into the work. If it, if, it, if it needs costume to be made for it, then you have a workroom, but then you also have the separate running running team and you may work with them or you may not see them for weeks because they'll be off on location you, but you'll still be, be sewing and creating what they need for the following one um and but also within the workroom you're saying about like the hours and the time so you might start off with a little core team of people but then you've got a heavy week coming up where you know you've got to churn out you know 60 to 80 background people in that time or you know maybe hundreds you don't know you get people in as dailies so that's someone who is sort of a freelancer that might not be working at the moment and you all end up on your phones going oh oh hello are you are you free are you working at the moment sometimes the conversation just goes are you working and you say yes or you say no and if you say yes they just say oh sorry I don't never mind and if you say no I'm not working they're like can you come in tomorrow and help us and you could come in the next day you could go I've done this before I've been phoned uh, like three o'clock in the afternoon are you working no can you come in tomorrow yes and Oh, it's just for one day they're like yeah it's just for one day and you get there and you get to the end of that day they're like can you do tomorrow and the next day like, yeah. and then on the Friday I said so do you need me next week or are you all right Friday morning and she went no no we'll be fine we'll be fine next week 
And then I got a phone call saying, are you working? And I'm like, oh, I'm just finishing something. Oh, can you come in on Monday? Yeah, of course, I'll be there. By the end of the Friday on the first job, the cutter went, are you available next week? I was like, I'm not, I'm sorry. I've now just agreed to go on to something else. So it's, you could either be a, on a solid team of six people, maybe working on a film for nine months, or some people float all their time from workroom to workroom and they might be going, oh, I'm three days here, two days there. Or, you know, I went on a film last year for one day to do, they said, oh, we need someone to do some hand sewing. Can you come in for one day? I was like, yes, of course, that would be, that would be great. Uh, I think I went in in March and I finished the job in June with the rest of them because it just became, oh, can you, can you just do another week? Oh, oh, can you just do this? So it is very different. Yeah, theatre, I had set hours. <laughs> I mean, you have set hours in film, but yeah, you know, there was, there was a very different, different pattern. Sorry, I've just really gone on there. No, I, mean, I think you're the only, good. well, you and Nikki are the only ones with actual film experience. Yeah, uh, I've only I've only sent things off to film and, and TV, which is very different. They just buy corsets or whatever and I send it and that's it. And then maybe I'll see it on TV in six months or not. Or maybe it'll get cancelled, you know. <laughs> Another big difference is also that you sometimes have to, ha for a film, depending how big your movie is, you have to have um, hero costumes, double costumes, stunt doubles, stand-in costumes. So you have to have multiple of one outfit or one costume made. Um, or if they're being like going through a stage where they're getting deteriorated or bro broken down, you have to have multiple different stages of those bre breaking down. Well, in, in theater, unless they also go through a storyline when they are deteriorating or whatever, um, you usually don't have multiple costumes um, of one particular one. Um, but they do have to be worn every night uh, you know, for every show and they have to last longer whilst movie costumes don't have to ha endure much as much as theater costumes do, so. Um. That's a good point. I watched a, a live with Michael Kaplan, the designer for Star Wars, and he did a little side chat about um, Fight Club and how it's got this grungy, vintagey look. And so everyone assumes that they're just purchased vintage costumes. But he said, well, no, because we needed eight of each thing. Yep. So they had to make everything to look like something he bought at Goodwill. Strange, and there's a whole really department. Good. I find myself watching that in TV myself now when someone, there was something where a person didn't change for a whole series because they were a ghost. I won't go into what it was. But I just and she was just wearing her normal clothes that she that she died in, and it was a really plain, stretchy bit of clothing. And I just thought, oh, I wonder how many of them they had to buy because I think they probably were bought. But I just couldn't, <laughs> couldn't stop myself thinking that rather than watching the program. Uh, uh, Constance, something that we had talked about um, offline a little bit was um, how within film, a lot of times the like the tight frames and stuff, like you're only seeing like this much of the costume but does that uh what does that come into play as far as you know making and the design I mean, yes it's I mean, obviously never forget that the whole the whole thing is a costume it must work as an outfit but um some really interesting advice i did have very early on working in film was that let's face it a close-up is going to be this so if you are if you've got it, the example was being used when making a blouse for a principal principal actress and and the and the cutter said you know make sure that I mean obviously you want things to be good but make sure that the collar looks as fantastic as it possibly can you know that the lapels are exactly what you know that is where you need to concentrate your work on obviously don't neglect anything else but that if you do something and you think oh that will be all right it's going to be on a cinema screen it's going to be enormous any little tiny thing is going to show up so really think about what's going to be what's going to be to be seen um, other things can be worked out. If it's a bit too long, that's, that's fine. We can work that out. Um, you know, we can make it shorter if we need to be. But, you know, up here has to be perfect, which is why, you know, hair and makeup is so important as well, because that's what's focused on. Um, and it has taken me a while to get used to this from going from theatre where it's got to look good, you know, at a distance and read for everyone wherever they're sitting in the theatre to where suddenly you're watching something on screen and, and the face is enormous. But then they can always catch you out and then go and film something at another angle and you think, oh, we didn't think about that. <laughs> also with continuity, it's a big thing in theatre. Um, you have like whole continuity Bibles made 
uh, because sometimes one particular scene is filmed two weeks apart or on several days and but in the in the storyline it's just like a different shot in the same scene so catching things you have to be really particular like a shawl is draped in a particular way that has to be recreated so you take pictures on set and you you write it out so the next time where they when when they do pickups you can take that bible and you can check oh that show was draped this way and like had pleats like that so it's like exactly so it looks like it's seamless yeah. well actually it was like filmed two weeks whole, apart. sometimes you have a whole person on set because we haven't even talked about like the on-set team but you tend to get oh Constance, you froze. Oh, <laughs> charge of dressing the crowd, and they uh, they have to look. So usually you've got you, know, you might be a standby. Sorry, my internet said it's going funny. No, yeah, you froze. It's working now. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it tells you too late that you've you, that you've that you've gone funny. So as a principal standby, you have to look after a character um, and make sure they are dressed perfectly for that moment that the continuity is right. But there's often sometimes on a big like a TV series or a big film, there's a separate person who's just doing all of the continuity Bible so that the idea is, yeah, as you say, six months down the line, they have to do a pickup shot. Whoever, whoever you are, if you've never worked on this film, you've never met any of the actors before, you can pick up that Bible, open it to the right page, go, oh yes, 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 and that's it. Dress someone and send them off. Um, this is why I don't do on set stuff, but you know, as with everything, you know, people gravitate to jobs that they're good at and and yeah. what appeals to them, and some people that is just their their whole world is the, is the perfection of getting that continuity right, and it's a really really important job. I had a real hard time on learning the continuity. I I was so focused on that continuity that when I moved to theater, I I really had to unlearn to look at those details because my my boss started getting really frustrated with me because I I noticed every detail. Well, on th on stage it doesn't really matter if things go wrong or whatever. But I was so still in that mindset of the continuity of the film set. It was like, it took me years to sort of oh, that's interesting, get that out of my brain. <laughs> I went theatre to film. So I was like, oh yeah, just get them on. You know, Because I also did work as a dresser backstage early on. So it's like, just as long as they're dressed and push them in the right direction, we're all <laughs> marvellous, you know. <laughs> so people going, oh, I, oh I mean, was that glove? Was that, was that pushed down like that? Or was that, was that scarf over the lapel or under? It was really interesting knowing the difference, but yeah, I went the other way. Yeah. <laughs> that segues really well into, you know, the difference to that theater brings and the challenges that theater brings as far as what it is that you don't necessarily have to worry about continuity because they're doing scenes on in front of the audience as it were, but what the challenges are for why it is so different that theater is like, you have to make things completely uh, readable and the story is being told from all the way back far in the audience to the people who are right in front. Um, so uh, for theater, like I know that instead of worrying as much about, you know, making the collar perfect and things like that, it's like, okay, let's make sure that we have a decent amount of hem in this so that, you know, it'll be good for the next person because the, the, um, uh, the understudy is going to be going on on these days and let's make it really durable and let's make it, um, you know, all of those things really easily washable because it's going to have to, um, you know, get washed eight times a week or so. So what other differences can Bernadette or Cindy think of? Well, from a design standpoint, mm -hmm. theater is much, you, you, it has to read from a distance, like visually, right, Bernadette? Like you, you have to think about that garment, but from over there, not from up here on a screen. Uh, which yields very different aesthetics sometimes. Um, and, you know, there are details that you might do on a film costume that it's like, that's a complete waste of time on a theater costume. Yeah, which is becoming actually now more of a challenge now that this trend of high definition filming Broadway shows is starting to become a thing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because the costumes aren't necessarily meant to be seen that close. And there have definitely mm -hmm. been times when I, because I know what I'm looking for, where I will sit like in one of the first rows of a theater and I will notice, wow, that the knee area on those trousers have been patched and patched and patched and patched. But that's not something that people would generally see from a distance if they're not looking for it. You know, I will study the costumes up close, but 
yeah so there's definitely I mean obviously theater clothes get worn a lot more they get I mean they're worn on Broadway they're worn eight shows a week by however many people usually it's supposed to be just one person um skin layers but over the skin layer the layers touching the skin it can be transferred between understudy anyway um so it basically they get a lot of wear and they get a lot of wash because they're supposed to be washed if not turned inside out and you know actually aired or dry cleaned um regularly if not periodically so these costumes take a lot of wear and they are mended and patched a lot because these clothes aren't cheap yeah. they're manufactured here in new york city every costume will cost upwards of several thousand dollars so you're not gonna order a new costume like this maybe i'll take them down off the wall but this is from aladdin but you know that's something that would have cost several thousand dollars to be made by the shop and it's worn by one of the ensemble folk in prince ali i believe so it's on stage for about three minutes but um these clothes need to be preserved and so there's actually a whole separate team of so i was talking earlier about the design team but there's a separate team of wardrobe who mm. our contracts end on opening night their contracts start well in tech when the show starts getting on stage for rehearsals but they're the people who run the show and dress the actors every night but there's also a separate sub team within wardrobe of day workers of people who come in during the day just to repair and maintain and wash the clothes so that's what they would be doing that was a big difference between the uk and the netherlands in the netherlands that was indeed a separate uh team that did the maintenance during the day and then the dresses while in the netherlands the dressers did the maintenance during the day. Wow, so, that's a long day. Yes, well, you usually had assigned one day in the week um, that was scheduled in, and then you had to do like the laundry and the ironing and the mending, and then you had to do the show. And then the next day, one of your colleagues did that same routine. So that was that was one of the big differences between the UK and um, my country. <laughs> I think some of that depends on the size of the production too, because I think like Anne uh, probably has witnessed, you know, the, the, it in regional like theaters. It, oh yeah. Well, in regional theaters here, usually the wardrobe team does all of that stuff. They run the shows and they do maintenance. Depend, it just depends on the, um, the, the like setup of the company. Yeah. No, it was the same show. It was Wicked in the UK and Wicked in the Netherlands. So it, it's the same big company, costume-wise. <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> uh, do we want to talk at all about uh, some of the differences between like big musical theaters versus like opera versus dance shows and things like that? I know, Nikki, you've done a lot in all of those things. <laughs> um. Oh, I haven't done opera. I mean, I worked for the Dutch National Opera and Ballet, but they were two separate departments, actually. So because uh, the singers don't have to be very active. I mean, sometimes they do have to do choreography, but like the ballets are like top athletes being able to raise a head, uh, a leg above their their head or whatever. So they have to be, have like full movement in their costumes and they're very specific. Um, and they're very conscious of their bodies and how they look on stage. So that's always, I think ballet dancers have much more of a say. Well, it's all, it always is the final say to the designer or the costume maker, but they can like contribute, oh, this doesn't feel right or this looks funny. Sometimes they have a say in like um, how the costumes work. But while like in, 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 in musicals, it's just, this is the design deal with it <laughs> basically well um okay so let's move on to um the process a little bit um so for everybody uh how long does the process i know that this is very different depending on the size and the scale of the show and the uh, venue and stuff but uh what are your guys' experience as far as how long the build takes Oof, it varies so I much. The show, yeah. <laughs> Usually for well, Broadway. Could... Do you want to? Yeah. Do we want to talk about one specific show that we worked on? We could, because we did work on one specific show together, uh, which was a short timeline, from what I understand. But highly right? unusual. It was, it was unusually yes. short. Yeah. yeah. So oh, I know. usually, yeah. what I found for Broadway is that 
a show will go out of town. So it will have a tryout somewhere else before it's on Broadway and the critics have to review it in the New York Times. And so there is a little bit of leeway. Yes, you get the clothes ready for that, but they actually have to be perfect when they go to Broadway. So there's an additional two to three months during between it's, that transfer to like- It's almost like, like a dress rehearsal show. Like you get to do it once and see what you want to change to take it to Broadway. Sometimes you make entirely new costumes for the Broadway yeah. the show. Sometimes you move things, it, it just varies. Yeah, but, then but the majority of the work go, is done for that yes. out of town triad. It's just like the finessing. Sometimes. Sometimes you go straight to Broadway in yeah. like three months. Well, they decided, so they had told us, here's what we were told, that in like November, they were like, yeah, we're going to go out of town. It's gonna... December, they were like, actually, we're going to come straight to Broadway and we open in March because we have to open before the Tonys or before the Tony cutoff date to qualify for a Tony, uh, which means that if the show was opening, no, it was opening in April, it was previewing in March, which means the clothes had to be done, done by mid-March, which means that there would be a whole additional like two week period before that of like on stage tech rehearsals where everyone's in clothes. So the costumes kind of had to be in a state of done by like early March and it was December. So we had like, wait, three and a half months to get the clothes. Oh, and then the additional snag was that the, uh, the Radio City Rockette show decided spontaneously randomly to do a spring show and there weren't existing spring Rockette costumes. So all of the costume shops in the city were busy doing 100,000 Rockette costumes because they had to build that whole show from scratch. So we were running around calling people like, please, can you take, oh, and by the way, this show is a massive musical. Everything is built. It's set in the Elizabethan period. So there's no buying stuff. Everything has to be built. 300 costumes in three and a half months. And, and they so. were big costumes too. Like just, it was just big. <laughs> Yeah, so we were running yeah. around town, like calling people, can you take three people? Can you take this one principal and her whole track of costume? We were kind of like sliding things under the table, as you know, because poor Cynthia was on the receiving end of this of like, can I, you take this I think one? I probably, yeah. I think I probably got like seven or eight emails like, you can do this little thing too. What about this? How about this? Can you do this? <laughs> and then also, because I was working long distance and I'm in Colorado, we were dealing with like snowstorms and shipping and- That was the worst winter in Ugh. like New York City history. It was snowing every single week. <laughs> yeah, so that's unusual though. Yeah. For another show that I worked on, there was an out of town tryout. And then there was like two years later, another out of town tryout. And then a year later came to Broadway. So that was about the same size as this other show, about 300 costumes, actually fewer costumes, but there was time to develop the design, to build off of what had previously been done. So it was less of like, quick, we have three months to build 300 costumes and more like- yes. We have time a bit. So for the, the, um, the ballet companies, they usually revive production. So they already have most of the costumes already in their uh, repertoire. And um, we, have a, we had a fast of a, like a steady company. So sometimes they just wore their old costumes and we did little alterations. But sometimes we had to like, uh, alter the costumes they were like 35 years old or whatever um, so usually we did that in about I think a month and a half to from starting on the costumes checking them mending them fitting and then to the tech, to the dress rehearsal to the first on stage and then we usually had the premiere either the next day or that evening um, so yeah for for ballet if it's if it's an, an existing production or if we get it from out of from a different ballet company, we rented it. It's it's a pretty quick turnaround. And what's your usual like time timeline? Where, like where you've been working lately? I mean, for a build, like week wise. For a build, usually the shortest timeline is somewhere around like six or seven weeks. Um, yeah. Really large, we, uh, really large builds can be uh, upwards to like. 10 sometimes 12 depending on like sometimes we have uh like we're working on the holiday show during the uh, summer months when there aren't shows going on so it just kind of depends again uh but yeah we we have like pretty darn good long times which is very nice 
but we also don't tend to uh, like uh, offshoot and like ask people to uh, like take certain ensemble members or things like that. Like it tends to mostly be in-house, at least the place that I'm normally at. There's also the issue of casting though, in theater especially. I don't know how this is different in film because I'm sure it's and even more last minute. Sometimes the day before they have to film. <laughs> yeah, like they only cast theater productions, I think about two months at most in advance. So a lot of the work we're commissioned, not commissioned, we're contracted to do the costumes for a show, but we don't actually have human bodies to fit these things to. And now Broadway dancers do have a certain standard of size, but so we can sort of like estimate where things are going to need to sit. But there are things that can be done in advance. Like if there's a lot of beading in a show, we have, you know, sent out uh, motifs that need to be beaded that can then be patched onto the clothes once they've been properly fit on the actors. So there is that additional time constraint of no matter how far in advance you're given the show, you can't actually start the majority of the costume work until you have the actors and their measurements. Uh, that goes very well into uh, what fittings look like for everybody because I know that those look very different, especially if you're doing things remotely or, you know, every theater is a little bit different. <laughs> Um, so what is everybody's experience with being there for the fittings or not being there for the fittings? <laughs> Who wants to take it? <laughs> or are you guys involved in the fittings very much? Like sometimes, like for me, most of the time I was, you know, a stitcher and sometimes for the first hand, we don't tend to be in there very often because we're out working with the stitchers. Um, occasionally I'll be able to go in and be like a second pair of eyes for the draper and be able to reference that um, and like hand safety pins and take notes. Um, but uh, sometimes I'm not involved in the fittings at all. It's usually just the actors, designers. And I was going to say, because I've, very, I've gone from theatre and different size theatres into film, I've gone through all of it, whether like small theatre, I'm in every fitting because we, we were a two person team initially in, in the small theatre. And, um, you know, I was always there as the, as the gopher, or can you go and find another pair of shoes that fit, or can you pass the pins, can you pass the safety pins, to moving into opera where you were, we were in two quite large teams and you were assigned certain uh, chorus members and then certain principal costumes. So you might go down and do a fitting with the cutter and you might fit your chorus member for all of, all of their costumes. And it was ladies, so it was her. You might fit all of her costumes for all of the shows she was going to be that in that year and you get to know her a little bit or and or them or, or whoever you're making for to working in film where I, i've been on some films where i've never been in a fitting at all it, it's all done by the designer and the cutter or the designer and the assistant designer or um and then occasionally if it's you know if it's something really intrinsic that you're involved in you might be called in to come and have a look and say oh you know please note that we're doing this you know put that into consideration or smaller stuff, it might just be your your spare pair of hands right now. They're like, hey, just can you just come in and give us a hand with this? Or you've you've done this, can you can you see this? Because you're going to be finishing it. So I've sort of been through the whole, I'm I'm happy to be handed something that's been fitted, it's been through the cutter, it's it's just handed to you and told like you can finish that now. Or it might be I'm the one in there because I'm the one that's available today if it's you know the theatre. Or it might be the consistency of this, you know, fitting the same person in their different clothes for a whole for a whole season. So I feel I've, I've done it all. I feel I'm out of practice of doing fittings off my own decisions these days because I'm always doing it for somebody else. You know, I'm just there while they make the decisions. Yeah, I find it odd when I go back because I also still have private customers that I make for. But it's like, oh, and today it's 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 my opinion, you know, is that <laughs> in this fitting, it's not just not just the silent pin pass <laughs> and, and note taker. Yeah. I thought um, for the ballet we had, the dancers were always in-house and they were like heavenly scheduled. So you had to schedule um, to get them in. And sometimes they only had like 10 minutes or 20 minutes or 50 minutes, but you had to fit them like 10 costumes within that time frame. Um, so, but they were like probably sometimes costumes they've worn before or they just needed some mending. So it was, it can, it could be like, very chaotic in the dress in the fitting room with us. Um, sometimes we even had three boys coming in um, at the same time, and there were only three people fitting. So we were all fitting individually in a really tiny space, fighting for the mirror space. 
and just okay take it off and just dump it out on on the pile and we'll figure that out later moving on to the next question because he has to go in five minutes so um we were always very time restricted when it came to fittings the, fitting the ballet dancers I, I can't think of anywhere where you're not time restricted for a fitting. I don't think I don't think anyone's ever gone. We've got the whole afternoon. Let's enjoy. <laughs> yeah, but like fitting ten costumes in like twenty minutes. I mean, <laughs> yeah, that sounds hard. <laughs> Um, with time constraints of uh, being part of the process for you know across every single aspect of this, um, uh, I think that one thing that we like to say is that we're really good at being adaptable as well as being able to figure out where we can cut corners, where we can take some of the shortcuts in order to meet some of those deadlines. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? <laughs> Other than that's what we do and that's, that's, <laughs> that's the art of it that we have to <laughs> figure out how to cut the corners and how to make the things done. Um, I think a lot of it is we like to say like it's all smoke and mirrors as long as it looks good on the outside and you know from the first row and not up close then it will do um if the if the time is tight um yeah i love my blind hem machine because <laughs> uh when you need to slam out a bunch of you know opera chorus dresses or something and you need to hem 18 Victorian gowns in a day. <laughs> yeah, um, technology is great and mechanic, like machinery is great. Yep. <laughs> yeah, 5,000 ruffled petticoats. We have to make more soon. We're going to get back into the petticoats. Oh no. Oh, my <laughs> condolences. I had, a, I had like a year and a half break and now we're back to the ruffles. Ruffling <laughs> today. Mm hmm. I, we, I think we all know that song very well. The, the <laughs> yes. um, okay, so let's uh, move on to uh, translatable skills and uh, what it is that we have as far as um, what our specialty is and how that translates into other things, other aspects of life, how it transfers to our um, uh, the rest of our careers and gig life uh, and uh, ever adapting to this changing world, especially you know, nowadays. Work um, ethic. Work ethic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we get stuff done on yeah. time. Yeah. Which is remarkably difficult. Um, some, you know, like sometimes that's a tricky concept, I think, for people to achieve. Uh, but we yeah. have had it drilled into us. Get your stuff done on time. Well, because like there's an opening night, like there is a yeah. date. The curtain goes up on this date. And there's I've said this before, but there's there's a little bit of magic in the world of theater or that theater teaches you in that no matter how stressed you are or how much work there is that has to be done, when the curtain goes up on opening night, everyone's dressed. Somehow everyone's clothing. It got done. The work got done. So that's just a bit of like peace of mind for me, no matter now that I work in a completely different field, but like no matter how stressed I am, if I have a deadline, that deadline's gonna come and something's gonna be done. That at least I know. For me, translating into business ownership and business management, all, all of the skills I learned as managing a costume team, you know, it, it's all translatable, it's all the same you know, managing workflow, managing people. Um, I'm really glad I took costume shop management in college because although I've never managed a, you know, or, or workroom, <laughs> I've never managed an actual shop like like in a theater, you know, I, I, I just sort of struck out and went, oh no, oh my gosh, I have my own costume shop, what? Um, but because I took classes in that, all of that is translatable to trying to operate a business and budgeting and all of those things together. I mean, theater is all about collaboration and teamwork. You either learn yeah. to work really well with people or you don't make it in this business. Yeah. That, and that yes. doesn't mean you have to be extroverted, I should also say, because a lot of us are severely not so. You just have to learn to be a decent person. Yeah, you and work well, work well with it. Yeah. I mean, what I've 
I don't know, this sort of relates to all of the questions we're going to ask. How do you get it done? How do you get it work? It's because you can work as a team, isn't it? And and it's all about moving moving everyone forward and like whether it's the performance or for the filming it's just moving everyone there to get there I'm thinking about the times when they bring in something that's meant to be on meant to be being filmed that morning and they go a recent example was a load of, of I mean this isn't this isn't into real life but this is something that you know how we all work together an 18th century dress was brought in and the stomacher was meant to be one that buttoned up the front that could be unbuttoned and the, the, the fronts had just been overlapped and the buttons sewn straight through it all so they weren't practical. And they just, it was brought into us. We thought it was a hired costume or had been made out and it just brought in. And the three of us in the room, we just, one of us set up the machine to do proper buttonholes. Someone threaded up all the needles in the right color. And then we just, the three of us worked together and, you know, handing, handing the things over that you need. So that a bit like a surgeon and nurses in an operation, you know, you're all, you know what, you know what is needed so you just hand it over and while you're and then you get another needle and thread threaded up and just hand it to that person and just being willing to work like that and happy to work like that and and know that yeah know that you're all there for each other and I think that translates hugely into life and that's far more valuable than a college degree I feel like we probably but we'll get into that in a bit probably yeah. <laughs> I feel like we've all had a little bit of experience of uh, you know the night before opening four or five people on the same costume huddled the over stories yeah <laughs> um, and I feel like things like that are only possible with really good communication and yeah. just willingness to adapt and pivot and um you know well, it's a lot of late nights yes. you know you're working into the wee hours and you're getting up early you're spending a lot of time with these people and if you don't like them and if you don't work well with them it's not going to continue to happen. It's very true. And also, I think you uh, you you learn new things every day, um, like construction wise or something. I mean, most of what I now know has is what I've learned on the job and not what I've learned in school. So, mm -hmm. you know, be open minded to like learning new stuff, um, and so you can evolve yourself. Um, and lift your lift yourself up but also your colleagues and get that teamwork um. <laughs> uh that's awesome so let's uh talk about uh some translatable skills from uh what we've learned in uh our industry to when we sew for ourselves as far as um sewing things and techniques that we use or you know uh, ways that we speed up our process, any of those things. Like uh, I've been asked a couple of questions about like how to speed up the process of sewing for yourself and uh, you know making things adjustable. Um, any thoughts on that? I never put a seam sewing. in the center. Put a seam in the center back of your waistbands on your pants. <laughs> right, <laughs> women's. <laughs> clothing is made so stupid like the manufacturing right the manufacturing is ridiculous but put a seam there when you're making clothing for yourself and then it will be alterable just like menswear Ooh. i always leave extra seams in the side or make adjustable things um even though i'm i don't personally i don't fluctuate very much with my size but i've just that's it's just been so brainwashed brainwashed in my head from working in a workshop that you know you never know if you need to do any adjustments oh, that's it. I, I won't ever cut the hems off my partner's trousers when I shorten them for months because in my mind it's like oh, what if there's a cast change you know you'll really regret that off. what if he changes height oh, yeah. you never know <laughs> this is very true I, I've uh, recently just like adjusted something that I was thankfully put theater scenes in uh, the side scenes of it to make it adjustable because as a person who does fluctuate, I definitely thank my past self for thinking of some of those things. <laughs> yeah. I, we make our corsets rather differently than we would if I hadn't been trained in theater, I think, because I put alterable alteration points in just as many, about as many styles as I possibly can, um, which like, for instance, we put I, these just happen to be sitting right here. Uh, we use lacing strips for our Victorian styles. So these are finished separately 
Um, so they're bound separately, finished separately, and then stitched on um, twice for, for durability. But that allows you to let it out a scooch or take it in a little bit more at the waist. It gets a little bit of fine tuning possible on these standard sizes because usually you hear like, oh, you can't alter corsets. And I'm like, oh, that sounds like a challenge. <laughs> That's not the case on all of our styles. Like S bends, don't do that to yourself. <laughs> but, but yeah, I don't think I would have. It would have occurred to me to make breaks in the seams in that way if I wasn't trained in theater for alterations. Yeah, it's really innovative what you've done, and it's like t teaching other people that you've done that, and sort of you you talking about it. It's been really interesting because yeah, I've got the theater background. I'm going. Oh, really useful that's great you know you look inside it where can you change it but also the historical point of view of going oh but that's you know it's I just I just really think it's innovative that you've done that and I love it that you've, you've also taught people how how they can help themselves as well and change their clothes like their corset thanks yeah it's mostly I started it because we I was marketing two theaters and so I thought well this will help for them but it's also helpful for the individual because you know, historically, a woman would be buying a new corset every couple of years or whatever, you know, styles change, they wear out. But if you are a hobbyist who only dresses up a couple times a year, that needs to fit you across a range of years and a range of uh, life experiences, shall we say. So, yeah. I know that as I started sewing for you, Cindy, it, I, looking at all of the ways that you did things, I was like, yep, this is brilliant. This makes total sense. <laughs> well, it's not, ac it's not historically accurate. Uh, so there is that, but it is useful, which is kind of my thing. Same, I, I always like to veer, veer towards the things that are good and practical and make sense to me and having things adjustable and speedy are always good. <laughs> But I think that's the thing like within the world of film and theater in that unless you're Shakespeare's Globe, like things aren't really made historically accurately because the time constraints and the budget constraints just aren't there for that. You know, you're not hand stitching stuff. Well, actually, we and do a lot of hand stitching, <laughs> but not like not regular, thing, like hand finishing. Well, like hand stitch finishing, which you yeah. have to do because you can't, like there is no machine to do that. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, Nikki, while we're on you, I wanted to bring up the small thing, but like so amazing and useful. And you had posted it somewhere on your Instagram um, of using uh, piping to finish your arms eyes so that you can like inset your sleeve and then just take them out and like switch them out with other sleeves and make your dress really versatile. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I shared it at some point and I did it for one of my dresses and I think I'm going to continue to do it forever because it's brilliant. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> um, I think that sort of was born out of um, the men's uh, classical ballet coats, um, especially because they have to do a lot of lifts. They have to be able to lift their arms. So what we usually did is uh, make a lycra top and so the arms on them on with the same like insert and then the rest of the top was just a vest so for like when they have they wear it it looks like one continuous jacket but it's actually like two separate items um and that sort of inspired me like wait but if i want to wear this dress as a day dress but also as a an evening gown when i need to have short sleeves and i have enough fabric for this i can basically do that the same thing and without ungathering the stitches constantly so they're ready to go and the piping hides the hand stitching them in um, if you do it in a ditch so that's sort of where that was evolved from um, and it makes it more vers versatile and i think it's sort of also uh, it it um adds to the historical thing i guess because they had like for one dress they had two bodice like an evening bodice and, an, and a day bodice um so i could do that by just exchanging the sleeves brilliant i love it um all right so let's move on to um us personally and what our training was and how it is that we got into the industry um, so for me, I went to school for theater initially 
for acting like a lot of people. <laughs> um, and so I got my BA in, um, in theater arts and um, I kind of specialized in costuming. Uh, and from there, I was able to meet a couple of people who were doing like internships and things like that. So then I did uh, like one summer stock and I met a couple of people there. And then through that, most of my um, uh, training has, has, has been on the job as well as just like most of my jobs have been some sort of theater relation and working in shops and for wardrobes and uh, local theaters. So that's just kind of where I went with it. And so it started at like 18. <laughs> what about everyone else? <laughs> okay, I'll go, I guess. <laughs> uh, so I think a theme that you will discover amongst the five of us here today is that none of our journeys are the same because this is kind of a like random, you find yourself in this situation type profession. Um, so I got my first Broadway show when I was 17. So I didn't actually initially go to school for this. I just kind of moved to New York and started working. But I did that because, and this is something that not a lot of people think to do. And this is how I've got every single job that wasn't through connections. But I just was like, okay, so I was sitting around, I need something to do this summer. What do I want to do? Well, my dream would be to work for this one designer on a Broadway show. Okay, let me see if I can find their contact information and see if they need help. So I did, and I sent an email and they said, yes. So that's how I got my first job on Broadway. No connections, no academic training. To be fair, this, like I did offer to work as an unpaid intern, which I don't necessarily condone. And this is something that I know Cynthia has opinions on. <laughs> I'm just gonna call you out there for a second. But um, so I don't recommend doing that for longer than you absolutely need to. But through that initial couple of weeks that I did that, I met people and I got to know other people working in the industry and I made the right connections to be able to get a proper job working in this industry. So I you know, bounced around to different design teams and worked on different shows for a while. And then I went to school, not because I you know, felt like I needed a degree to work on Broadway, but because I felt like it was the thing to do, like one needs to have a college degree, right? <laughs> um, and that was actually, it ended up being for the best because it turns out that working in theater, as much as I really adored it when I did it, in the long run, it was not going to be for me because it's very strenuous. It's a lot of physical labor, what I was doing, and it's long hours. And that's just not something that I'm physically suited to. Like I would have got to 35, had a slew of medical issues. Like there was a point where I was just in physical therapy three days a week. And that was, you know, I just looked at my expenses and I was like, wow, this is eating up an entire half of my expenses because hashtag American healthcare. You know, I was paying for all of that out of pocket because I was out every single day carrying pounds and pounds and pounds of heavy fabric all over the city in 100 degree heat. Like my body doesn't take that. So I was, you know, spending just as much on keeping myself alive as I was on. But anyway, so that's becoming irrelevant. So I ended up, you know, moving on to theatrical, uh, to historical dress. So I will say the where I was working specifically, I was working as a design assistant and there's a lot of years of assisting and doing off 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 Broadway shows for no money and you know doing a lot of this physical labor yourself before you meet the right person who books a Broadway show who hires you to do the Broadway show where you can have people working under you as a designer so I was just like I don't want to do this to myself to get to that point I, you know I'd, I'd kind of rather just do this but this is again just the position in the web of costume jobs that I was doing, I would have been equally happy probably working in a crafts position or working in a costume workroom doing the sewing. And um, that's a lot less strenuous on the, the physical uh, person. I will say though, that the most important thing in this business to getting jobs is the connections. And if you can't get the connections just based on where you are, like if you're not the good thing about going to school is that it physically uproots you and settles you into another place with other people who are working in that industry. Like the reason I was able to get a job with no experience and no connections is because I, well, I did send an email remotely. 
but then physically uprooted myself and moved myself. Like if that's not something that you feel like you're capable of doing, you may have benefit in going to school, not because of the educational value um, necessarily. They will teach you some good stuff if you're willing to, you know, actually apply yourself. Um, but it's honestly a lot of stuff that you can learn on the job as I did. To be fair, I didn't actually learn how to sew on the job until I started doing that stuff. But um, the one absolutely priceless thing that school will do is put you in the right place, um, in a position to receive opportunities, in a position to be preemptively working with the people who will give you jobs. And if you do want to be a costume designer, it's not necessarily working with other costume people that is gonna be beneficial, but working with people who are in a directing program, mm -hmm. actors, maybe, I don't know, people who are going, go, gonna go on to be producers, who are going to be the people who have the power to hire you in the future, people who you can start your own indie theater company with. You know, you can't just necessarily always walk out on the street in wherever you are right now and say, who wants to hire me to make costumes because you're not really in the right place for that. So that's my two cents. In the Netherlands, it was quite different in the way that we did not have any educations for theater costuming or costume design, whatever. Um, I had to find my own way and do a um, confection industry um, seamstress. So I just learned to do confection clothing and um, but I always wanted to do theater. So when I got I got um, um, approved for that education, they the teachers knew that I my mindset was always aimed towards theater and I was allowed to do my assignments theater um, related. And um, for my last year of um, that school, I had to do an internship uh, and I wanted to do uh, Wicked on the UK. So I just basically wrote a letter to the head of wardrobe um, asking if they had a place. So yeah, do the thing as Noelle says, just do the thing, contact them, ha put on your, your bold shoes and try to contact them and um, you will get a foot in the door. Um, well, the and reality then is like, sorry, 99% of the population are too afraid to do that. So if yeah. you're the one person, I've had every person I've worked for say to me, if you hadn't got in touch with me, like this never would have happened because yeah. these people don't have time to be pursuing people. It's only yeah. the people that come to them. You need, to, you need to make the first move. Yeah. That's why Anne worked for me. <laughs> but yep. she did it right. This is why, well, other than that, she is highly skilled and awesome. Um, but this is how Anne worked for me. Cause I get a lot of people asking like, can I work for you? But they'll just send me an email that's like, hi, can I work for you? And I'm like, I, I don't know, can you? <laughs> <laughs> Anne sent me an email that, sorry to, to hijack for a second, but she sent me an email that said, hi, I read on your, hello, we met at Costume College. I think we follow each other on social media, you know, let me reintroduce myself. I read on your FAQ page that you are not hiring. So, haha. -ha. She read the thing, Re read the things Do first. your research. <laughs> However, I have a break from this date to this date and I'm able to figure out my own housing. Would you have need of me then? Huh. <laughs> it was yeah. so much less work on Cynthia's. Yes. And yeah, as the they person have... hiring is like. Exactly. Yeah, I can't tell you how many hours I agonized over that email. <laughs> <laughs> because I was really specific about talking about the, at FAQ about how I knew you weren't hiring. <laughs> and I was like, here's my break. And, and I'm that, pretty that sure impressed me so much. <laughs> I'm like, yay, somebody read. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I like called Bernadette and talked to her about that email several times. You sent it to me to proofread. <laughs> oh, that's funny. The truth comes out. Um, <laughs> sorry, Nikki, to, to sidetrack there. Oh, that's but, okay. Um, <laughs> But, I but feel yeah, like, like make it make it easy to be hired, <laughs> yeah. and show some intelligence, like base intelligences, you know. Yeah, like you know, you have an interest, you have passion, you know what you're doing, you want this anyway. Go on. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, for for film, how I got into film was, I got very lucky that the head of my school um, was an old school buddy of a costume designer who worked for film, and he was like, "Hey, my old." 
a buddy from school was doing a new movie and do you, would you like to work for that? Because he knew I was into like theater and, and film costumes and stuff. And he sort of, ho he set me up with her and that's how it basically all got started. I got very lucky. Um, that doesn't always, is the, that's not always the case though. You have to work for it and do the thing yourself. That was just um thing. And then from that one, at least another, you know, the connection thing, you have to be in, in, in the cycle to get to the next job and stuff. But yeah, that was all I was going to say. <laughs> Shall I, shall I talk about what I did? Yeah, um, go for it. So I, I started off actually not thinking about working in theatre. I was just obsessed with costume and I was obsessed with historical costume. So I got a job age 17 working for somebody who made historical costumes, mostly for reenactors, some for museums and whatever jobs came along, little bit of historical wedding. And that was going up to her at an event and saying, do you want somebody to work for you? And it involved me moving across the country. And it was a, it was an odd situation, to be honest, because we didn't quite know how it would work. She'd never had someone in that situation before. I'd never worked for anyone before. I just knew I loved costume. And it lasted about a year and so that was about as long as we could stand each other. And so then, and then I came home going, oh, well, now I'm now I'm 18 years old and there's absolutely nothing I can do with my life because I don't know what I'm doing. Um, it's all ruined. Um, and then I, and then, because like, because how, how do I go on like this? And then I, through, through conversations that my parents had with somebody else, someone mentioned a small uh, college that did a theatre costume course and it was only three days a week and they, let, and they had so few people on it, I went and joined it midterm. And then once I got there, I realised that it was sort of, it was really a sort of, um, like a foundation course that then passed you on to a university or art school course for, for theatre or design or fashion whatever your sort of path was going and I was like well I suppose I could go and study theatre costume but that's not what I want to do I mean I love the theatre but I want to make historical costumes purely historical costumes that are you know perfect and excellent replicas so I went to Wimbledon School of Art which unusually for a lot of UK uh, theatre courses has a separate design for costume and costume interpretation course so you go in there knowing that you want to make costumes and you go in there wanting to be a designer obviously they have a, let you have a little shuffle around after the first turn in case someone goes oh actually I think I need to be over there oh no I need to be over there but I went in there going right I only want to make that's what I'll do and I did that but I did the whole three years feeling that well I'm not going to work in theatre when I when I finish this I don't want to why would I want to make stuff in a theatrical way it's ridiculous and I sort of fought them the whole time going well that's not the authentic way why would you do that why would you wear a t-shirt under a costume that's not right you know you need to wear a chemise um uh, and part, part, way through, I realized, part way through i realized that maybe this wasn't for me and i looked into costume conservation thinking all right maybe i need to go down a different route and fortunately that was also the year you did your work experience and again like like nikki has said and like bernadette has said and, and a bit like what Anne has done i thought well the v &A do fantastic costume conservation. I better write to the v &A. and fortunately, someone who worked in the v &A conservation department had done the same course as me. And so she went, oh, you're at Wimbledon. Yeah, we don't normally have costume makers as our work experience people, but yeah, you're at Wimbledon. All right, come along. And I did that for two weeks. And that also made me go, oh, maybe costume conservation isn't for me. I mean, this is fascinating, but I'm not really making anything. And it was fascinating. The stuff they showed me backstage was incredible. The stuff they do is incredible. So I was like, all right, okay, fine. I'll go and finish the degree. Finished the degree, left, um, applied for a job in a theater straight away. Because <laughs> I thought, well, I've got to work. I mean, I was lucky. I always had people I made stuff for throughout my, the right, I, I was very lucky in the fact that while I was at university, because I had had some experience of making, oh, I'd also worked at the Globe Theatre before that. I forgot that. I went to the, I went and worked casual hand sewn <laughs> costumes at the Globe when they were still doing authentic practices before I went to university, which was also really my dream job. So, you know, I did that, and then, um, yeah. So I always had things like you say, you know, you get to do the, the like the off Broadway, the 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 smaller theatre jobs. I was doing all of those jobs while at university because I knew I could do that I, I knew I could do the little jobs on the side I knew I could fill in and do that I even did some film work on the side I just I took anything while I was there 
thinking, well, it's all experience, thinking I'd leave, set up a business and make historical costumes on my own. And then I left, the theatre job was offered, advertised straight away. It was in a small theatre where you had to do everything. And I thought, well, maybe that would be useful to do it. And I did that for three years. And then I moved into opera, which was again brilliant because that was just concentrating on making. And then while I was at the, at the opera house, a uh, costume designer came into the workroom. She actually came in to fill in She's a film costume designer, but she came in to fill in in the in the workroom for just a strange circumstance, and she met us all. And she noticed that every lunch hour and every tea break, I was always doing something at my table that wasn't work. I was always making something else or doing something else. And at the end of it, she was like, "If I well, it wasn't then, but at some point, she got in touch with me after she she met us all, and she was like, "I'm going on to a film. I need someone to sew for a day. Could you just come in and do it?" And I said yes, and I went in and sewed for a day, and I went back for a couple of more days. I took days off my job to go back and fill in. And she was like, right, next time I do this on a big film, do you want to come and join me full time? And I was like, yes, I do. And that, yeah, gone on from there. So yeah, not at all where I expected to end up. And I still love the historical stuff. That's still my love, but it's my love personally. It's not my job. <laughs> Great. Everyone's had such a different journey and it's been really interesting to hear about it. And like, I don't know if anybody has any uh, situation. Wait. Oh, did no. Hi. <laughs> no, <Sorry>. what's <laughs> funny? It's all good. Uh, what's funny, Constance, is I actually looked at Wimbledon. Yeah, I did. It was one of the, I thought, ooh, maybe I want to go to England for school. And then I decided that that sounded a little too scary. Um, oh, that's that's just, we, had a Canadian, we had a Canadian girl who came over who specifically in the year I was there and yeah and, and people come from all over the world to go there it is unusual in the fact that it does say from the beginning you can do making so if you yeah know and that's what I was specifically looking for um, I got started in this really young so I I think my mom taught me how to machine sew when I was seven um, and then I was always kind of just making, sewing stuff. I'm always, I've always been making things. I, I like to make stuff. Um, and making clothing was interesting in that, you, that there's a bit of three-dimensional thinking that I found really interesting. And then you start tying in historical stuff. And uh, I was that weird kid wearing like prairie dresses around, uh, pretending to be Laura Ingalls Wilder. Um, I never dressed up in princess dresses though. I was always like the tomboy one. Um, but then I started making Halloween costumes and that kind of thing. And then a little movie called The Fellowship of the Ring came out. And they had the expanded DVD collection, right? And there was an interview with Nyla Dixon, the costume designer for Lord of the Rings and they showed the costume workroom. And I went, it's a job? <laughs> <laughs> like I literally ran downstairs and went, mom, it's a job. I could like make costumes for movies, it's a thing. <laughs> and I'm very lucky to have very supportive parents who indulged my various interests and they were like, oh, okay, that sounds reasonable. Um, so I started making costumes like I, I got kind of, I went down two rabbit holes at once. I went down the, I want to make super screen accurate Lord of the Rings replicas rabbit hole, you know, cause it was like 2002 and that's what everyone was doing. And then I went down the, I want to make really historically accurate costumes rabbit hole also. And I started working at a living history site near my house because it was an excuse to make Victorian gowns. You know, I'm like, oh, well, I have to make a new dress because I, it's for my volunteer job, you know. Um, I should add also that I was homeschooled, which allowed me, um, in my specific circumstance, allowed me more time to devote to my peculiar interests than I might have had if I was in a school setting. Um, by, by the time I was in high school, I was doing group classes and online classes. So it was homeschooled, but it wasn't just like me by myself. Um, but it did let me have more time and anytime I wasn't like doing school like oh I don't want to do school I just want to sew things and like do this fun stuff that's what I was doing so I 
it was a natural choice to want to go to college for costuming. Um, and it's a good, it, I, I think my education was really valuable and uh, it helped me learn all of the skills that aren't the sewing part. Because I came in with a very strong set of skills. I could make patterns, I could sew. I you know, came in to my fr interview at, at my school with you know, fully made costumes and they were like, whoa. But what I didn't have was any sort of knowledge on how theater works or the industry works or how to work with other people or how to fit other people. And that's what I got from that. Um, and, and, and as you guys were saying, it's the connections too. Cause then, you know, the track that you think of for costuming in the United States for theater costuming is, okay, so you go to the school and I, and I picked School of the Arts because it is one of the places like Wimbledon that has a specifically tech program. Cause I knew I wanted to make stuff. I did not want to be a costume designer. That has never been something that I have found um, like particularly compelling for me. I want to make stuff. And uh, School of the Arts had that. And they also weren't going to force me to take an acting program, <laughs> <laughs> which was a plus in my book. Of course, looking back, I'm like, you kid, you should have taken an acting program. That would have been good for you. Um, but yeah, so the track is usually you go, at, or you know, things are changing now, let's just say. Um, but in the 2000s, it was you go to school, you learn costuming you go to New York and you work in New York in the shops and that is what you do and that is your life. And maybe someday someone will retire and you'll get to be a draper in one of those shops and that is your life and you live in a small apartment and you make very little money and ta-da. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I decided I didn't want to do that. So I made the choice not to move to New York because I decided that New York was going to like drain my soul. <laughs> I, I went to visit, I thought I wanted to do this. And then I went to visit New York for like a week or so, my junior year of college. And I went, oh no. <laughs> I know, I, I, it, the people who can make it work there, Bernadette, you, it's amazing. I don't know, I don't know how you live there. It's astonishing to me that people can. Um, I don't know how you live in the middle of nowhere, so. <laughs> <laughs> Fair. Yeah, so I didn't do, I didn't move to New York. But the other issue, the other thing about my track is that I graduated in the middle of the recession when all of, like, the theaters were laying people off and now that pales in comparison to our current circumstances. But I saw all of the people who had graduated a few years ahead of me, like, losing their jobs or not finding work and I thought well I have no experience so how am I gonna like compete with them because now they're in the labor pool too so I started selling my stuff off like all my costumes off on Etsy um, my senior year of college just to make money and it it worked people were buying them and then they kind of settled on asking me more and more for corsets and now I have this corset business turns out um, and that's kind of how that happened and I actually was doing then I suddenly I found myself doing more historical repros for individuals and occasional theater contracts like summer theater or you know I went and worked at a university for a few years for for a you know I came in and did their show in the spring and the fall for a few years um, and in between I was filling it in with the historical repros and then all of my friends who did move to New York a few years later started contacting me and saying, hey, you wanna make some stuff for this off-Broadway show? You wanna make some stuff for this Broadway show? Okay. And then kind of, it's funny because then I found myself doing Broadway in Colorado. <laughs> and it's just been this kind of funny circular thing. Um, at this point, we are primarily doing the, the corset business well, uh, even before um, COVID, we were we had transitioned mostly to corsets with the occasional big theater project because it could take it, it's a lot of work to retool 
the shop from corset production to, okay, now we're going to make clothes. Like it's, it's kind of a big transition. And so bringing the project, the theater projects we bring in have to be big enough to kind of warrant that sort of like flip. Um, that was a long ramble, but here we are. <laughs> but yeah, we all have different, it's, it's interesting how different, but also similar, a lot of our I like the fact I like the fact you say you picked it because you didn't have to do the acting side. It wasn't sports. I picked Wimbledon because it was the only place that didn't make you costume the productions that the school was also doing. So I, I don't want to make your costumes. I want to make what I want. So that's the only reason. Oh, I that's funny. The only one that didn't have a, an acting part even remotely attached to it. So I was like, nope, that's why I'm going there. So that's so funny. Some people don't like it. Like, people in the industry don't like Wimbledon because they're like, you don't make for performance, you don't make for actors, you just make. But I still think that you know the making is important, and that's but that is why I picked it. Uh, that actually transitions pretty well into um, the fact that something that we had talked about offline um, and we want to present. Um, because I personally got a lot of questions about uh, like how to get your foot in the door in the industry and how to get started after having graduated just recently and uh, like how to start working. And um, I think I can speak for all of us except for Bernadette about the fact that like the state of the world right now has been very affecting um, our work and um, you know, the state of the world and uh, so we obviously cannot speak for what's going to happen in the future. <laughs> um, we only have our own experiences and uh, what we have done, but uh, I feel like I can say that, you know, it, it's not gonna be forever, of course. Um, and, you know, Renaissance happened after a big old plague. So maybe the, everything <laughs> Shakespeare will wrote his Shakespeare wrote his best work in quarantine, arguably, so yeah. yeah. So while, you know, some things are in pause as of right now, um, you know, it'll come back. And if anybody else, like, does anyone, see, like, I'm not even sure how to go forward as far as, like, what advice would you give someone who graduated? I'd be like, here's what I said to, here's what I said to um, a group of students I talked to a few weeks ago, because this is a very difficult, like, this is scary, and that's okay, and it, it's, it is, uh, something we have never experienced before, exactly. But the arts have always survived through history. Arts are one of the few constants, right, that that make it through. And speaking as an employer, I will not care if your resume in five years says graduated with a costume degree in 2020, worked at the grocery store for two years. I don't care. That will not impact my hiring choices at all. So all of the old stuff about like, you need to get work experience, you need to have a job in your field. Now at this point, you use the skills that you have to be a good employee and like work, do the work you need to to survive right now is basically what I'm saying. You have skills that are transferable. Um, a lot of us joke about being one trick ponies, right? But we're actually not. Like we were talking earlier, we have really good time management skills. We have people management skills. Um, if you are a current student and you're studying costume design, you probably have really good graphic and digital art skills, which are transferable to a lot of different places. So think outside the box on that because online graphic design stuff that is still going. So there are things you can do and it will be okay, but it's okay to be like worried because that's, it, it is, it's crazy, but if you're not there. worried, like you should, like there's probably <laughs> some concern there, but yeah. But we yeah, we're choosing we'll, to remain optimistic. Yes. Yeah. And I think even before this, um, there was, there was discussion in costuming about, you know, you don't just have to do that go to New York track that I talked about. I think that that was already shifting and people were realizing that there are other things you can do um, it, related to costuming. There's so many options. And I think that this is just gonna help 
uh, make that tr more true. Um, I think the face like of constants. costuming is changing. Like now yeah. we've got film, we've got theater, but we've also got reenacting. And we've also got this whole new world of whatever is happening with the internet. Mm -hmm. And people now with this like whole new realm of people getting interested in historical dress and adopting it into everyday existence. Like this is all just starting to happen in the last four or five years. Like who knows where this is going? There's so much room for experimentation and interpretation and for something new to happen. Yeah. Like what you're doing, Cynthia, is like wasn't heard of five years no. ago, however many, seven years and ago. I'm it's been 11 years. Um, <laughs> okay, a lot of years ago. <laughs> well, I mean, the first four were kind of a wash, but yeah, like there are so many options. Um, so, so think creatively. Everyone in this field is creative. So there, there are things. And if the thing is just doing a job that's not related, that's, that's fine. Um, before we move on to questions, do we want to talk a little bit about work-life balance? What's that? I know. That's <laughs> kind of the thing that I feel like we probably should address, just because I know my own boundaries on it are, is not great. <laughs> um, so for me, briefly, I just want to talk a little bit about that, because I feel like I talk about it a lot in my Instagram posts and all of that stuff, because I need to set pretty fat pretty good boundaries for myself as far as you know work and all of that because I'm a person that tends to get pretty burnt out pretty quickly so if you'll notice I tend to only make one big costume a year so that is something that like it's not a hard boundary but it's something that like I know that if I'm really burnt out I'm just going to take a while and I don't necessarily am going to feel bad about not sewing for myself because I still enjoy it. But if I am creatively burnt out and I force myself to make something, it's just not going to be fun. And that's not what I do, why I do it. Um, so that's, for me, what one of my boundaries are. Um, so if anyone else has any other thoughts about work-life balance, I don't know. I just sew basically or do costume-related stuff 20 no not 20 hours a day but like when, from when I get up to when I go to bed it's just it's on my mind 24 7 costuming sewing creative things anything so I, I, I yeah so you just never stop that's awesome <laughs> um, see my I'm in a weird situation now where my fun has become my work. I'm still not sure how I am supposed to cope with that because I do hear a lot of talk about work-life balance. Hey, you should take a break. Hey, you should, you know, do something for yourself sometimes. But I always find myself like, oh, I, I'm, I'm giving myself a day off. Here I am writing a script because that's what I'm choosing to be doing with my, like all of my hobbies have become part of my job which I realize is a supremely unusual situation to be in and this is something this is a developing situation because I guess I have to find some new hobbies now isn't that like the most supremely millennium millennial <laughs> issue in the world <laughs> but yeah I'm not sure I can answer that question because I'm not sure that I understand the concept of work to then have a life <laughs> I'm, I'm the same it's my job and my and my hobby are the same thing but they have definitely got a dividing line down them yeah so I do there is definitely one and the other but it does mean I am always sewing <laughs> oh, and I used to hate going on holiday because then I'd have a, a wonderful idea of something I could be doing and I almost don't like to be away from the potential of what I could be doing usually when I'm working and doing the stuff I'm supposed to do where I'm getting paid for it I'm sort of longing to be at home working on my own projects um which is very that is true but yeah it's just which is sort of the upside down of this this uh quarantine lifestyles that i am allowed and able to do that at the moment and it would suck 
sort of in a way getting back to work and not being able to do that <laughs> anymore. Although I must say, even in my situation, like I do have contracted deadlines for projects and for videos, which are like more work, I guess, than others. And those are the ones that are like, I don't want to do this today, but I have to. Yeah. So I, I guess like those are the work it. ones. Yeah that, yeah, that means that one's work. <laughs> yeah. I mean, all of the videos do bring in revenue, but some of them are like, this one has a contract and a deadline. So it's yeah. like, OK. Yeah. Yeah, and of course, that's the one project that I don't want to work on. <laughs> I think I'm pretty good at this actually. I don't know. Everyone who watches me on like from afar is probably like, what? No, you're not. I'm gonna take notes. Uh, but Go on. No, I I take I take weekends, you guys. I take weekends off. What is a weekend? Sometimes. There's a lot of Saturday. <laughs> as I, as I sit in my space on a Saturday. But like I I do. I think part of that is that I, I wanna spend time with my husband and with my pets and with well, <laughs> the four times, you know, people. Um, but like, I, I do take breaks. I think partly because I know that if I burn out on this, this is my thing. And so if I burn out on my thing, that's not good. I got really close to burnout last year. I did too many things. Like I kind of ramped up, did too much. And now I'm just sort of coasting, but uh, a professor of mine once told me that art imitates life. You have to have one, which is a little thing that I just keep in my head, which is ironic coming from someone who taught at a performing arts school and worked crazy hours and was often in, you know, theater production crew at 11 p.m., but still, yeah, I it's a nice little like reminder. Good. Um, okay, so we're getting closer to the end of the panel. So anybody in chat, I am watching you guys. If you guys want to uh, drop in any questions of things that we've talked about or any questions that you have, um, go feel free to do so. Um, and in the meantime, uh, one of the questions that we were pre-asked, uh, we wanted to talk a little bit more about, um, someone had asked about quick rigging, uh, and we wanted to talk a little bit about some of our favorite techniques and how we do quick rigging things. Uh, does anyone want to start that? Magnets. Yeah. Magnets. Yeah. 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 Magnets are key. Magnets are Magnets are good. <laughs> That's how Anastasia happens, is magnets. <laughs> Can confirm. Not that I've sewn magnets into stuff, but I have seen things with magnets. Yeah, you get the really, really heavy duty ones. Although it doesn't work so great when you have a steel set, um, as we discovered once in school and the actor's tearaway jacket, he tore it off and it went flying and stuck to the set behind him. <laughs> <laughs> These magnets, so by the way, to... those of you who don't know what they are, they're, they, they're like magnets, but they come in like a packet so that you can like- Yeah, like a little pouch. Up. Yeah. Yeah, they're neodymium magnets. They're designed for like purse closures, I think is generally what they're supposed to be for, the like clutch closures, but you can order them by the heap from like AliExpress. <laughs> Are the magnets that you guys use, uh, like ones that actually have like a hole in the middle that you can sew through? Because I just recently started using those and those are great. Oh, those are, that sounds cool. I haven't used those. Yeah, I don't remember what the company is, but we found them and they come in all sorts of different like, um, uh, strengths and widths and stuff and those are really cool because you can fully secure them um i mean like one of my favorite quick rigging things that i've done recently hopefully i'm allowed to say this but um there was a quick rigged um uh, cloak that was supposed to like tear off of a person and like there was a big reveal um and it was made out of china silk because it was supposed to get really condensed and like pulled into a tube and so we had magnets down the front. We only had like four magnets down the front, so it would really easily break away. Um, and there was a really big honking um, button that was on the back so that a performer could like grab onto the uh, button and pull it through the tube. And so it all just broke away really quickly and like within a second. So that was a fun little quick rigging thing that, you know, turned out extremely magical at the end of it. <laughs> um, um, well, I, I had one question that I forgot to fill in um, that I thought we would 
uh, cover during the whole positions in the in the industry uh, and we didn't cover. Um, so I would, if it's okay, I just want to quickly um, explain what it was. I got the question what a swing dresser was. Um, oh, yeah. A, a swing dresser is basically, so you have in the ensemble, you have the, everyone has their own tracks that they do on stage. Um, and then you have swing people that are, whenever someone is sick or um, is on holiday or has a day off, they can fill in for that people, but they can cover multiple tracks. Um, that's the same for dressers. Um, a dresser has also has a track backstage that they do and uh, a certain routine they do in order all the quick changes or prepping stuff, etc. And a swing dresser is someone who is able to fill in for a colleague who is uh, has a day off or a sick or whatever. Um, so it's basically like the swing is the understudy for the entire ensemble. So like a principal character will have an understudy, but the ensemble has a swing, which is one person who knows the exact track and choreography and movements of every single person in the ensemble. A swing dresser is like an understudy for the entire dressing team. So they know every dresser's entire choreography backstage where this person takes which costume to what part of the stage at what time. And they'll be able to cover if a dresser needs to call out. Yeah. And just those... like the ensemble switch swingers have like swim Bibles where they have those tracks all written down and what they do and what, what route they do. I make the same thing for myself. I, I type them out with all the cues. Oh, and this cue, music cue, we have to go there or quick change or prep this because a lot of the actors have like very specific routines or things that they like to do or how they like to put things on. So I like to keep that, um, to do that as, as much as they are used to do it. Um, if you ever get a every quick change, shirt, go on. Oh yeah, I, I was just gonna say every quick change has a choreography to it. Yes. yes. And if you don't know the choreography of that quick change, it is gonna go off the rails. Yeah, because yeah, their quick change is as fast as seven seconds on Broadway, I think is our, the quickest change I've seen in any of the shows that I've done. But if you ever get an insert in your playbill saying, this person is on a swing, you applaud that person because that person yeah. is working eight times as hard as anyone else in that ensemble. Yeah. And they are supposed to be on the ready whenever during the show, they have to be like in going position whenever somebody falls out, gets uh, hurt or whatever. So. The next time that you guys all watch Hamilton, watch those credits, you'll see the, the labels and the titles of all of the people in the costume department, every department, but also all of the swings, all the swing dressers, all of the actors and stuff like that. It's all in there. <laughs> uh, we have a question here. Um, how do you deal with designing historical or anything intricate or structured costumes and stretch fabrics for dancers, aerialists, or physical theater performers? I mean, um, one thing that I will say is, um, you know, Stretch panels are fantastic. <laughs> yes. Uh, that's one thing, speaking of Hamilton, um, that you can see very easily in the, uh, because everything's so high definition, like you have uh, the women in like structured stays pretty much, but there are stretch panels on the sides so yeah. that it will give the illusion and the shape of the, uh, Bernadette has a great video on that. You yeah, I was like, I mean, I could say what I just said in that one video, but yeah. again, because it's theater, like, it needs to look good from afar, which is why silhouette is so important. So like in the historical theatrical shows that I, none of it has been original practice. None of it has been historically accurate. We're all using, you know, sparkle shears and plastic metallic brocades and all that stuff just because like, you know, maybe that's the designer's preference or maybe that's just, you know, what he chose in this moment because we need to make a decision and move on and not like search for the one perfect like wool brocade. That's not a thing, um, but <laughs> uh, but the most important thing is just getting the silhouette right. So at least, you know, from where you're sitting in the audience, it doesn't look like this 18th century show is actually Elizabethan. You know, you're not crossing your silhouettes over because there can sometimes be a fine line between some things. You know, this isn't a bustle gown, it's 18th century. I Even think though there's like sparkle brocades. <laughs> Um, we have another question. Um, what advice do you have for foreign people? I live in South America and there are not a lot of historical costuming opportunities here. Um, as far as like different areas that uh, don't necessarily have as many 
um, opportunities. Uh, what do you guys think as far as that goes? Um, I'm sort of in the same situation that uh, I sort of already, I've worked at the biggest companies in, in the industry here in this, in this country. Um, and uh, I stopped working there. And if I want to continue doing that, I sort of have to go abroad. I have to go to either England or Germany um, to, to keep doing this work because here in the we don't make um, period dramas. Um, they come by maybe once every 10 years or something. So uh, if you really want to do historical stuff or like big fantasy movies, you have to go there where they are produced. Or, you know, use the internet as leverage. That's a, a thing that's starting to become more of a thing nowadays. Obviously now Cynthia can work from Colorado because people know who she is and people know how to contact her, but you can only reach that point if people know who you are and know how to contact you. So you can, if you can't necessarily get to know people in person, there is the opportunity to start putting your work out online and to start trying to get attention that way. Uh, what kind of thing is important to include in a portfolio? It depends what you're applying for. Yeah. If you're mm -hmm. applying for making, you're going to need a lot of samples of stuff that you've made, full costumes as well as like individual techniques, which I'm sure you can speak on as employers what you're looking for. But from the design perspective, you should probably know how to draw or at least render digitally convincingly that doesn't, you know, look. Anyway, um, you need to be able to communicate visually. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Communicate your design effectively in that that communicates that you have a cohesive, cohesive design sense, which is obviously like subjective to everyone, but uh, and I want to say it's mainly just like confidence. Like you just have to assert, like put yourself forth, like you know what you're doing and people will take you seriously. <laughs> If I'm honest, this have a neat a portfolio. Don't make it like messy and unesthetic. Organize it well. Uh, this is a really, really, really specific thing too. But um, leading up to me knowing that I was going to ask Cynthia if I could work for her, um, I definitely made a very pointed effort to put a lot of Instagram <laughs> pictures up of my work, like of my stitching work, of my precision work. <laughs> it was something that I the seeds for for a while <laughs> oh that's so funny you're welcome oh uh, yeah it's that's like, what i want to see use yeah. your internet presence Don't. as a portfolio absolutely yeah. uh at this point i well gosh i haven't put together a portfolio in years personally my my personal website is a sad place don't go there um <laughs> but if, what i want to see i want to know that you can sew i want to know that you can sew accurately and that you can um that you do fine detailed work. So a bunch of pictures of like someone out in a field looking awesome in a dress that you sewed that's way over there is not gonna do it for me. I want to see details. And if that's pictures or actual samples, that's, you know, that, that's what tells me. Um, but then also just the ability to communicate information effectively in that portfolio tells me a lot as well. And, um, please credit the designer. Please be specific about what part of that garment you worked on um, and like what your role was in making it. And, uh, you know, credit the director and the show and just have all the information there to give the project full context, I think is important. If you're doing it for like a, you know, professional portfolio or website like that. I have actually been told, you know, after the fact, like after I'd been hired, like writing well is really important because obviously you're not necessarily going to get hired by a Broadway designer as a 17 year old if you're writing, you know, in a certain way. Like, and it's not, it's not to say like you have to write like an academic essay because I don't think that's effective either. That just makes you feel very closed off and cold and they can't actually get to know you as a person. But one thing that I made a point to do when I was in school is because I was only taught to write academically or like, you know, as an early 2000s teenager, which don't, please don't write like that. But 
I made a point to take a lot of creative writing classes and to do a lot of creative writing practice so that I could learn to write in my own natural voice and to communicate my own character in words, which I think is really effective in, because character is another really important thing. Again, people don't necessarily hire 100% for skill, they hire a significant portion for personality and for whether or not they want to work with you and whether you would be a good fit for the team. So communicating your personability is really important. <laughs> huh? um, let's see, sorry. Chat is uh, overwhelming. Is it, <laughs> I haven't, I'm not looking at it, so I don't know what's happening in there. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, this is a, a little bit of a thinker. Uh, if you could magically change one thing about the industry to improve it, what would it be? Equal pay. Yeah. Equal pay. <laughs> or just like fair wages in general. But fair wages, fair wages yeah. across the board. Yeah, and we haven't gone like entirely into this and like that is the simplest way that we can say it. But I mean, as far as comparing costume shops versus, uh, you know, light operators and scene shops and stuff like that there's there's a pretty clear disparity and we all know it you know we very much feel it and wage equality is the phrase i should have blurted out but yeah <laughs> yeah well the unfortunate reality and the thing that we're kind of like noticing now is that the costume the job of costume making is so much more labor intensive than say lighting i don't want to say that those people don't do as much work but it's just that there's a lot of like physical presence needed in making clothing. You know, clothes don't just materialize out of nowhere. It takes a lot of effort to make these clothes, to fit them on actors, to source the clothes if it's modern dress. It's a lot less, there's a lot less like component, elemental component in lighting design because there are lights. Whereas there's a whole, not only like range of modern clothing, but also historical backlog of clothing that is like a potential opportunity to. Anyway, the point is there's a lot more hours arguably involved in costume making and the proportional wage of costume makers, arguably because it is viewed as women's work. Yeah, wage discrepancy is a thing without getting too political. <laughs> that was it nicely, I think. Uh, do we have any recommendations for books or other resources to learn more specifically about stage costuming? Oh, well, I, um, I have an Amazon list. I'll, I'll, maybe I'll put it in the comments or something of books that are useful. I have my affiliate store listed in the description down below that has a whole book list as well. Um, there you go. The, the series uh, um, Costumes for Stage and Screen by, mm -hmm. what's her Jane name? Jane Hennessett. Yeah, yeah, Jane Hennessett um, is a, a big recommendation um, because they are specifically focused on it being for the stage or screen, uh, besides being historically accurate. There's also the Costume Technician's Handbook and the Costume Designer's Handbook. There's also a book, uh, I forget the title off the top of my head, uh, about dyeing and fabric like manipulation for stage. And there is a good one by, about millinery as well. I don't have any of my books here in front of me. So um, yeah, but so look at Nikki's list. And put it in the link. Yes. I think it also does depend if you're working with certain people a lot, you work in certain ways, or I found, you know, certain cutters have a way of doing things and, and, and designers have a certain way they want things. So when I worked at Glimeborn, Jean Honeyset had been the head of costume there like 10 years previously. So they were still, a lot of people have been trained in her way of doing things, but they'd also developed that into their own techniques. But then I've gone on to work into film and I've been working for a cutter who comes from a fashion background a lot. And he has a completely different way of approaching and starting things but he's also fascinated by history because he's now doing more costumes so he's just reading anything he can get his hands on so it also does depend if you're working in one place then it might be one book is definitely the book to get and if it's theatre Jean Honeyset probably will be 
but if you're freelance you have to be quite adaptable and, and work to the people work for the people you're working for so so really any book is useful because you know you will you will have something from it that will that will help you okay uh maybe let's do like one or two more questions um one general question um how has sewing for the stage or film changed the way that you view or do home, home sewing and vice versa Basically, i mean what i've learned on the job is what i've been doing now because i learned so much more technical stuff since i started working at the workshop for the ballet uh so i can see a like all of the things that I've learned there is what I'm doing now. It stopped me being afraid of the sewing machine because I, I'd loved hand sewing as a student and then worked at the Globe, which was all hand sewing. And anything that was a bit tricky, I'd do it by hand. And I went into the theater as like, do it by machine. And now I love them, but I also love the fact I get the choice between what, when and what I use. I, so I think it took away that fear of what the, what the sewing machine did. And some people say to me now, you know, oh, or don't like industrials, they go too fast. So I'm like, no, bring them, bring it on. But it's also the time and the place to use them. Yeah, I would say for me, um, I have thought a lot more about the practicality of um, making clothing and costumes for myself. Um, I, for example, I will always find a way to put a bag or a pocket on myself especially if we're doing like events or cons and things like that. Like you always have to have your phone on you, like, and to not have it seen. Um, and like, as far as like, I mean, it, keeping things adjustable as much as possible um, for me specifically, I know that is a thing that I always need. Um, and so like, th those are all just things that I definitely always put into my sewing and my, myself. Oh, and durability because I know myself. <laughs> Um, all right. So I think that maybe that is going to wrap it up for questions. To do. Let's see. What else do we have to do? So thank you guys badges. all for joining us. Yes, we're going to put the badges. <laughs> we're going to put the QR code for everyone who has uh, joined us. I'm not really sure how to do that. I think you have that, Nikki. I'm, that um, yeah, I'm going to. Great. Cool. Yeah. See if we break it again this time. <laughs> <laughs> the server has been down multiple times since Coco Fit started. I think it's really funny that we're just like breaking the servers <laughs> with the <laughs> amount of traffic that happens. Does anyone else have any other closing remarks? You can do the thing. If this is something that you actually really do want to do you can absolutely do it passion does count for a lot i think yeah. and and never think that you've learned it all there's always something new oh to work God, absolutely but to move me on to, from moving from from theater to film i met a i met a designer who just said i love love moving from job to job because i learn something new every time you know and she was at she's at the height of where she is and she said, I love moving from job to job. I always learn something new. And I thought that's that's how I need to be. That's how we all need to be. That. Yeah. All right. Um, thanks, everybody. Yeah. yeah thanks, thank you for joining us. This has been yeah, fun. It was an absolute treat talking to you guys and everyone in the chat. Thank you for coming. Uh, I hope it was um, informative for you and that we answered most of your questions. Um, so yeah, I hope you have a great remainder of your COVID weekend and collect all the badges. <laughs> well, later. Thanks for Thank you. Bye. Let me end the live stream. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs>